which aspect of it just the people that you meet it's so nice so because we are live right now so jonathan what i will of course thank you very much for being part of the symposium and obviously always supporting me in the work that i do so it's really nice so if you, all you have to do is you have to introduce yourself i want to introduce you please introduce yourself and take it from there i am out of the picture your show now thank you so the topic for discussion uh, this afternoon i said this afternoon of course it depends uh, where uh, you all may be but the topic for discussion mediation in our culture and traditions in england um now i am jonathan lux my background is uh, an international commercial lawyer i practice most of my professional life as a solicitor and partner in uh, a leading city of london law firm uh, specializing in shipping international trade and other international commercial law areas then about 10 years ago i stepped down from the law firm went back to school bar school studied for the uh, bar finals was called to the bar of england and wales and practiced from uh, a set of barristers chambers in gray's inn um, but mostly undertaking mediation and arbitration work some advisory work as well um so that is enough i think about me um i'm going to address um of course the topic mediation in our culture uh and traditions before i do so though just a, a few statistics i had the advantage of attending this morning uh a webinar put on by the singapore international dispute resolution academy who conducted recently a, a detailed survey into international dispute resolution and um uh, one of their findings is that um the most popular international dispute resolution means uh break down as follows uh international commercial arbitration 45% uh litigation 22% uh mediation about 12% and mixed mode which means in practice mediation is one of the constituent parts normally um another 12% so um reading that uh intelligently suggests that already mediation has overtaken litigation as the next most popular after arbitration uh international means of dispute resolution now um earlier this year or perhaps it was last year with covid you know and lockdowns i'm mixed up as to time i i was asked to um write a chapter on uh maritime arbitration uh for a book that is about to be published and for that purpose i looked a bit into the history of dispute resolution now i'll quote if i may just a uh, part of uh the preamble to um that chapter um i i started by talking about the rise of the british empire and the industrial revolution which started in england span the three centuries leading up to the second world war key maritime institutions include include the lloyds insurance market uh which traces its origins to the lloyds coffee house opened by edward lloyd in 1686 then there's the baltic exchange central to the international trading of ships and cargoes which has its origins in 1744 in another coffee house in the city of london the growth of the british empire an empire on which it was said the sun never set just interrupting myself there it may now be said that the sun uh, never rises on what's left of the british empire but anyway at the time it, it was that vast it never set on the british empire um 
the onset of the Industrial Revolution, leading the steamship to replace the sailing ship, led to a dynamic growth in international trade and a similar growth in the merchant fleet. With that growth uh, came also, uh, with that growth in shipping and world trade came also uh, a marked increase in the number of disputes. Now, English court proceedings for much of this period, and this period being the three centuries preceding the Second World War, were extremely slow and laborious. Indeed, the English commercial court was brought into existence in 1895 to enable disputes to be determined, and I quote, uh, justly, expeditiously, and efficiently, and without unnecessary formality, which was a radical departure from what had gone before. So what then of arbitration, and this will be the final quote from what I wrote in, in the preamble to that chapter, and I'm quoting Lord Mustill, who um, was one of the greatest maritime lawyers of modern times, uh, and was a House of Lords judge. Uh, by the way, in England, the House of Lords has now been renamed the Supreme Court. It's the same body broadly under another name. So Lord Mustill wrote an article in uh, 1988 describing the history and background of arbitration. And I'd like to just pause there to mention that arbitration old arbitration as opposed to modern arbitration, was um, a broad label that covered um, most, if not all, extrajudicial means of dispute resolution. So in other words, including mediation itself. Lord Mustill wrote, uh, commercial arbitration must have existed since the dawn of commerce. All trade potentially involves disputes and successful trade must have a means of dispute resolution other than force. From the start, it must have involved a neutral determination and an agreement tacit or otherwise to abide by the result backed by some kind of sanction. It must have taken many forms with mediation no doubt merging into adjudication. The story is now lost forever. Even for historical times, it is impossible to piece together the details as will readily be understood by anyone who nowadays attempts to obtain reliable statistics on the current incidents and varieties of arbitrations. Private dispute resolution has always been resolutely private. At first, the arbitration may often have been indistinguishable from whatever procedure occupied the role of litigation. If the tribal chief or the council of elders or the whole tribe itself in conclave assumed a function of adjudication, there may simply have been no room for two individuals to seek out a third for a binding ruling. But as soon as society became sufficiently complex and the social unit sufficiently large to give social and geographical room for alternatives, extrajudicial settlement would spring up. Allowing for obvious differences in context, the motives would have been very much the same as they are today. The official system was too slow. The dispute could not always wait for the justicia to arrive on circuit or for the Lord to return from the wars. It was too expensive, etc. So, um, that's what I wrote in the preamble to that chapter. Now, um, I must say I'm obliged to you, Vikram, because before doing the reading leading up to today's presentation, 
I had been under the impression that there was a linear development as regards dispute resolution in this country, which until recently did not include mediation. But I will be demonstrating to you that I was wrong in this assumption. So my assumption uh, before now was that linear development started um, some centuries back with trial by combat. Literally, the stronger party, physically stronger party, would win. Uh, second stage was justice administered by the sovereign personally, the king or queen, visiting uh, the place where the dispute had arisen and determining the dispute. Of course, with population growth, that became unworkable. And still today, the judges are called the uh, Queen's justices. So the judges of the High Court are um, the Qu king, uh, are the queens, of course, today, justices. If there were a king, it would be the king's justices. And indeed, the main uh, division of the High Court of Justice in London is called the Queen's Bench Division. So um, justice administered by the courts. And then similar, but in origin quite different, arbitration which again is a rights-based system, a third party, not a judge, but uh, often a peer, often someone with knowledge of the particular industry uh, determining the rights of the parties. And then my assumption had been uh, that mediation come, came to these shores uh, relatively recently within the last 50 years or so, uh, and who knows, for the future, maybe it will be um, uh, justice by artificial intelligence, uh, machines that will decide the outcome. Already there are some instances with certain disputes online, um, dispute resolution by uh, AI. So we've moved in terms of what is the backdrop to all of this? Well, trial by combat, obviously that's a force based system. Trial by the sovereign or by the courts or indeed by arbitration is a rights-based system. Um, with mediation, uh, that's radically different. We're looking at an interests-based system. And who knows in the future, it may be a technological system with artificial intelligence. Uh, God save us. So um, there we are. Now, um, what I thought, um, yes, I, I wanted to just add to that on the subject, you know, my, my assumption that uh, mediation um, was uh, a relative newcomer to these shores. Um, I jumped to that conclusion because um, of course, modern mediation, it seems to me, has its birthplace in the United States. Of course, there are ancient traditions of mediation elsewhere, in China, in other parts of the Far East. I, I had the great um, benefit, advantage of, of doing postgraduate studies in France. Uh, and One of the professors, absolutely brilliant man, wrote a book called Les Grands Systèmes de Droit Contemporain, and he was comparing the, let's say, amicable means of dispute resolution in the Far East with the adversarial means, which are more common in, in the West. And I had, as I say, assumed that uh, mediation as now practiced, um, we, we derive from the US, where, and it's not so surprising to me that it was born in the United States because it's in the United States that the twin evils of cost and delay in the litigation process are at their most extreme. So that was what I thought, but I appear to have been wrong. And um, 
I'd refer in particular to an interesting article uh, written by a gentleman, a researcher and fellow of Downing College, Cambridge, who wrote a very interesting article entitled Settlement of Disputes by Arbitration in 15th Century England, 15th century. That's um, indeed uh, going back um, a while. And uh, as I said before, arbitration for this purpose is um, a, a wide label that encompasses not just arbitration as understood today, uh, mostly conduct, not exclusively, but mostly conducted by lawyers and with lawyers representing each of the parties. It was um, a much uh, broader notion to, to encompass effectively all extrajudicial means of dispute resolution. Now, I'll be quoting quite extensively from this article because I wanted to be sure of my ground, having been proved wrong, that indeed I was um, wrong and um, paid uh, close attention to it. So what the author of this article is quarreling with is the orthodox view, which maybe is partly what I relied upon before, holding that developments in the law and effective governmental power spelt the death knell in this country for arbitration and other uh, non-judicial means of dispute resolution. So um, the author of this article, he says, the history of arbitration procedures and extrajudicial forms of dispute settlement in medieval England remains largely unwritten. This neglect is no doubt attributable to the precocious development of the common law, which has monopolized the attention of English legal historians and left them little time to consider alternative forms of dispute resolution. In part, the lack of interest in arbitration stems from a deep-rooted assumption about the nature of legal change in England. Simply stated, it is that legal development is linear and progressive from the most rudimentary beginnings in the early Middle Ages, law has been continuously refined and expanded with minor interruptions under the absorptive unifying authority of the crown. In this scheme, consensual modes of dispute settlement, such as arbitration, stand very near the beginning testifying both to primitive levels of legal thinking and to the lack of effective governmental power. It is assumed that the growth of formal legal institutions and elaboration of legal doctrine in the 12th and 13th centuries rendered such procedures obsolete by providing more authoritative and effective means for settling disputes in the king's courts. Law and arbitration have been, have been regarded as mutually exclusive. The rise of the former, law that is, is taken to imply the demise of the latter, while evidence for the continuing practice of arbitration in the late Middle Ages is interpreted as a reversion to earlier forms necessitated by the virtual breakdown of the legal system. So um, that's his starting point. Um, he goes on. There has, however, been no systematic investigation of arbitration procedures in medieval England 
to confirm or disprove these assumptions. Such work as has been done tends to cast doubt upon them. Research on medieval love days shows at the very least that informal methods of settling disputes flourished well before the 15th century. Now, I think at this point, I owe you uh, an explanation as to what a love day is, lest it be thought that I'm propositioning anyone using that term. Uh, a love day is a day appointed for a meeting. It's Old English. Uh, it's a day appointed for a meeting between enemies and litigants with a view to an amicable settlement. So that's the meaning of a love day. And you'll see references to love days um, in the extracts that I'll read to you from this interesting article. Um, the author then devotes the rest of the article uh, to demonstrating um, the proposition just advanced to be wrong and setting out numerous examples of arbitrations and mediations um, throughout the centuries. Now, um, Vikram, feel free. I, I find this fascinating, but if you think this is um, too dense material for some of your listeners, then I can break off at any point that um, no, no, you no, tell me. Is, no, this is perfect. But, this is what we need. This is exactly what we need. But I, I find this stuff absolutely fascinating, I have to say. So the author continues. He says, recent studies of the late medieval nobility have shown that great magnates and councils were involved as a, mass, a matter of course in arbitrating or mediating disputes submitted to them by petitioners. The king and the great magnates deliberately promoted and encouraged settlement by negotiation. The practice of resolving disputes through extrajudicial compromise, whether by direct negotiation, mediation by third parties or arbitration was widespread and commonplace throughout medieval Europe. There are good grounds therefore for questioning the assumption that evidence for resort to arbitration in England merely implies a brief aberration from the norm of litigation within a well-regulated and efficient legal system. So I'm sure you see the point. What was previously suggested was that as the law developed, as the courts developed, as the power of the crown to regulate, uh, as these all developed, so there was less and less need and scope for extrajudicial determination. And the whole purport of the article is to show, no, that is not so. I shall, attempt, I shall attempt, the author says, to show that arbitration procedures, while clearly influenced by legal forms in the 15th century, nevertheless remained independent of court supervision in most cases and continued to perform functions to which the courts could not aspire. They could settle feuds, make peace, and restore harmonious social relations between disputing neighbors, all the sorts of virtues which we claim for modern uh, ADR. There is ample evidence for arbitration and other forms of compromise settlement in both secular and ecclesiastical disputes from the 13th until at least the 17th century. There can be little doubt that long before 1400, arbitration was well known and widely practiced throughout English society. 
Equally, there is ample evidence for the continuing importance of arbitration in the settlement of disputes long after 1500. It is apparent, therefore, that the use of arbitration in 15th century England was hardly novel. Rather, the evidence points in the opposite direction and suggests that there was always a place for compromise procedures within or alongside the machinery of the law. The importance of arbitration emerges clearly from research into provincial society in 15th century England. Arbitration was used by the gentry to resolve disputes within its own ranks. Most arbitration awards were made locally where the disputes had arisen and were negotiated by arbitrators from the same classes as the disputants themselves, the magnates and gentry who dominated local society. The author goes on to set out um, numerous examples of uh, so-called awards, which as I say, were really a mixture of mediation and arbitration. Uh, he goes on, uh, the terms of this award, and I'm not going to quote further from the uh, any further details relating to the particular dispute, the terms of this award demonstrate the flexibility and lack of formalism that constituted the greatest advantage of an arbitrated settlement over a legal decision. Whereas appeal of homicide and the mind boggles because no one I think today suggests that mediation is the right procedure for criminal cases. But um, here we are, a case uh, apparently involving homicide, um, whether center stage or at least uh, part of the case. Whereas appeal of homicide was capable of determining only the culpability of Lockwood's slayers, the arbitrators authorized a whole series of reciprocal acts which restored the peace and laid the basis for future harmonious relations between the disputants. Um, then referring to uh, another case, he said, several uh, features of this case are worth noting. In particular, the use of mediators for the preliminary negotiations, the local standing of the arbitrators and the large retinues allowed the parties for the love day. I've explained what love day is. The large retinues were basically supporters of each party, which, um, and there was always that danger just under the surface that that large retinue could include uh, effectively a small army uh, and force. Uh, this was to have been no courtroom confrontation, no pale imitation of the legal process. Rather, it was an attempt on the part of the gentry community to contain a violent dispute and to exert pressure on protagonists to accept a peaceful solution. The records of arbitration, though much plentiful, though much less plentiful than legal records, are fortunately far more informative regarding procedure, and they enable us to reconstruct in some detail the stages which led to the making of an award. Preliminary negotiation, so he's talking about arbitration as conducted at the time, uh, through these centuries, uh, 13th, 12th, 13th and onwards, uh, through to the 15th. Um, preliminary negotiations towards the settlement were usually carried out by mediators between the parties in dispute, as for example, in the two awards involving John Broom. 
Once both sides had agreed to submit to an award, the arbitrators were elected. And then he goes on, um, certain other aut authors he's referring to stress the function of friends and counselors who, and he quotes, must assuage anger, soothe wounded pride, and find the solution that will bring peace. The examples given above show that such groups still retained a crucial mediatory role in 15th century England. Flowing from this involvement of the local community in negotiating settlements, there emerges a second parallel, the emphasis on peacemaking as the primary goal of the arbitrators and mediators. So as compared with the role of the courts, of course. The terms of these awards, and that's awards, he, if you're interested, it's worth reading the article which goes into the um, various awards. The terms of these awards suggest uh, still another parallel. It was noted that a salient feature of the settlements examined was their tendency to create new social ties between recently conflicting parties. Most disputants within local society had links of some kind with their opponents, whether by marriage, political affiliation, or in the case of a monastic house, family association. The immediate issues in debate might therefore be comprehensible only in the light of the longer term relations between the two parties involving old grievances still nourished and tensions left unresolved. A successful settlement was one which took these matters into consideration and attempted to redress them, allowing the disputants to re-establish relations on a new footing. And he goes on, the law courts could decide only specific legal issues through consideration of a few highly selected, selective facts and circumstances deemed relevant to the case. What they could not do was make peace between the litigants. Indeed, by leaving one side empty-handed and defeated, they were potentially divisive, threatening to prolong and exacerbate disputes. By contrast, the main purpose of an arbitrated settlement was to restore peace between the parties. And with this end in view, the arbitrators were inevitably led to consider the dispute in its broadest possible context. He goes on, it seems that the, quote, good lordship of a magnate like Richard Beecham, Earl of Warwick, or of George, Duke of Clarence, was expressed more typically in supervising the peaceful and impartial settlement of a dispute than in pursuing the vexatious suits of his retainers for political advantage. At a different social level, the trade, craft and religious guilds, which flourished in late medieval England, performed a function analogous to the bastard feudal retinue in providing mediation in disputes between their members. Uh, I won't go into bastard feudal retinue, but um, time doesn't permit. Um, hastening on, uh, all it means is actually the feudal uh, lords who were responsible for 
uh, let's say, lo local administration. Arbitration, whether by a magnate and his council, by local prelates or by a panel of gentry, was one of the principal means whereby such communities sought to contain disputes which had arisen within them. The practice of arbitration thus provides a valuable insight into the workings of local society and the extent to which the formal administration of justice through the courts was supplemented and perhaps bypassed by conciliation and compromise, which enabled the issue to be settled locally. The more disputes which could be decided out of court, the fewer opportunities there were for outsiders like the royal justices at Westminster to meddle in the community's affairs. The king and the nobility needed the support and cooperation of the knights and gentry in the shires because the latter retained a considerable degree of initiative in local administration. So there you have it. Um, there was throughout these centuries, uh, certainly from the 13th century onwards, um, a system of so-called arbitration, which included uh, within it uh, mediation, um, uh, which coexisted with um, justice as administered by the law courts. So um, moving on uh, from love days and the like, we have mediation as practiced uh, today. And um, one of the very topical issues, and Vikram, I'm, I'm not clear. I mean, you asked um, that we address culture, mediation in our culture and tradition. But I also thought it appropriate to look at mediation today and perhaps just a bit of a crystal ball gaze at what the future might hold. And um, a big issue right now is whether mediation should be made mandatory. Uh, we have a very recent report released just uh, on 12th July, so less than two months ago, by the Civil Justice Council, which concluded that um, mandatory uh, ADR uh, is lawful and should be encouraged. Now, it's a few steps away from actually saying, right, we now have mandatory mediation in this country, as certainly exists already today in certain other countries, um, but it's the green flag uh, to that possibility. And um, that marks, uh, if you like, the death knell for what had been regarded as the leading case in this area, a decision of the English Court of Appeal in, I think it was 2004, in a case called Halsey, where um, Lord Justice Dyson had held that the court has no jurisdiction to force unwilling parties to mediate, as it would be contrary to their right to a fair trial under Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights. So uh, the Civil Justice Council report took the view that that is um, misguided, there is no conflict, if at all the right to access to the court is simply delayed, um, but is certainly not um, uh, in permanently impeded. So, uh, of course, another question entirely, whether um, there should be 
uh, mandatory mediation, whether mandatory mediation is a good idea. Um, I, I tend to think not uh, for reasons which um, I don't think there's time to expand on now. Um, but probably the key one is that it risks becoming a tick box exercise, uh, a, a phase just to get through as quickly and painlessly as possible before getting on to the real, getting back to the real business of having your dispute decided by the court. So I'd rather voluntary mediation than um, compulsory mediation, um, but it, it's a real live issue uh, right now in England as to whether mediation should be made mandatory. Um, we have, um, it's always difficult as Lord Mustill explained in the article I, I referred to right at the beginning of this talk, uh, where he said uh, private dispute resolution is resolutely private. So it's difficult to get hard and fast um, statistics. But we do have in this country a biennial um, CEDA report. Uh, they do a very thorough um, poll of um, both users and mediators. Um, so practitioners, everyone involved with mediation and produce, as I say, a very valuable biennial report. Um, the latest report, which I think was issued in, I think it was May this year, um, they quote um, these figures. They say the total value of cases mediated annually in this country, and that's commercial cases, by the way, uh, 17 point five billion. So that's that's the figure, 17.5 billion pounds, the total value of cases mediated annually in this jurisdiction. Um, since the launch of the of commercial mediation in 1990, the total value of cases mediated in England and Wales, <clears throat> 155 billion pounds. Um, their next statistic, the savings made by businesses and individuals in the quicker and more effective resolution of commercial disputes per annum, 4.6 billion pounds. So that's um, broadly um, savings in legal costs. And then finally, since 1990, the total savings made by businesses and individuals, 40, million, uh, 40 billion pounds. Um, now, the Ministry of Justice uh, is right at the moment, um, has called for an expression of views on uh, dispute resolution by alternative means, non-judicial means. And the cynics might say that's because it would enable the Ministry of Justice to achieve great savings in, in terms of its budget. Uh, and by the way, just before I get on to the uh, call for expression of views, um, also just very recently within the last few days, uh, I've seen an article, Ministry of Justice pushes on with court fee increase despite majority opposition. Um, so obviously many in the opposition were arguing that this was the wrong time to increase costs due to the impact of COVID when there is inevitably an increase in the number of disputes. But on the other hand, as can readily be seen, uh, it's a cloud with a silver lining because it's a further incentive to parties to um, mediate. So the, um, just a few days ago, I was invited to attend a meeting with uh, the Ministry of Justice and what they're interested in exploring is how to settle disputes away from the court um, and ensure that more people can get resolutions in ways that work for them. 
the Justice Minister, Lord Wolfson, said this, too often the courts are not the best means for reaching such outcomes. That's why we want to improve the range of options available to people to resolve their issues, ensuring less adversarial routes are considered the norm rather than the alternative. And the final um, issue I wanted to look at is it's sort of both now and the future. It's something we're just on the cusp of. And it's this, uh, I think um, one can see that um, the issue of our day is or is it about to become uh, climate change. And the environment has very much moved center stage, top of the agenda for uh, government, for industry, uh, for all of us. And the dispute resolution world is no exception to this. So I think there are two aspects to this so far as dispute resolution in general and mediation in particular are concerned. Um, firstly, it can be predicted that there will be an explosion in the number of environmental and climate related disputes. Um, secondly, uh, mediation, of course, other forms of dispute resolution as well, needs to be conducted in an environmentally friendly way. So um, dealing with the first point, the impact of new climate, climate neutrality laws, um, one of the members of my panel, Mark Clough QC, is a leading uh, EU and environmental lawyer. And he gave me uh, two examples of such um, possible disputes or, or impacts. Um, the first one, uh, A contracts with B to supply steel wire and cement for building a factory out of concrete and breaches the terms of the contract, specifying that the steel has been produced without the use of electricity generated from fossil fuels, and that the carbon emissions embedded in the cement used to make the con concrete uh, benefit from free carbon emissions allowances under the UK emissions trading system. Met with A's defense, that the steel and cement products are fit for the purpose of building a factory and that B is not entitled to repudiate the contract, B agrees to mediate with A. Eventually, after many hours of virtual negotiations, B accepts by way of settlement of its claim that A will supply a wooden built factory manufactured by one of its other subsidiaries from timber sourced from sustainable forests. So one can see there is already now and there will increasingly be a huge impact from the new climate neutrality laws, which will become a worldwide phenomenon, it's safe to predict. And uh, the hope must be that um, parties will, uh, that we won't let businesses, if you like, tear themselves apart through litigating these disputes, but will uh, instead incentivize um, mediated outcomes. Then, um, secondly, I wanted to refer to, um, sorry, could you bear with me just once, one second? 
Sorry, Vikram. Um, I had. Um, can you literally pause the recording yeah, yeah. for one second? Thanks. Won't, we won't pause it. It's, I mean, Reza and I will have a discussion till then. <laughs> okay, I won't. Yes, sir. Yes, Reza. How are you? So basically, you had some questions. Which, if let's say, if Anna has a uh, Anna has a session, so if she comes in, then we might not be able to take questions. Let's see how it goes. Yeah. Okay. 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 No problem. Perfect. Sorry. So the um, second aspect, are, are we good to continue? Yeah, yeah, please. So the second aspect of this is um, how mediation itself can be conducted in a more environmentally friendly way. And there is um, something called the uh, Campaign for Greener Arbitrations and what they have written could extend equally well to uh, mediations. Um, and, and they uh, pointed out that campaign for greener arbitrations, that offsetting the carbon, the carbon footprint of just one large scale international arbitration could require the planting of up to 20,000 trees. It's crazy. Absolutely crazy. I mean, the traditional way of dealing with disputes with uh, mountains of paper on each side, with parties at the drop of the hat flying halfway around the world to attend meetings, um, with physical hearings um, attended by uh, multiple individuals from, at least in my field, as I said, international commercial, with, with parties from around the world, um, of course leads to, uh, is completely unsustainable. And so this campaign for greener arbitration uh, has been looking at um, ways to mitigate uh, the environment, uh, the environmental impact, including uh, corresponding electronically, encouraging the use of video conferencing, encouraging the use of virtual hearings, um, and avoiding, in that context, uh, unnecessary travel. Now, all that said. Um, in relation to arbitration could of course equally well apply to um, mediation. And it's perhaps in that sense that COVID of course has been a disaster uh, and a tragedy for many people, but at least um, it has served to demonstrate to us that we can work successfully in other ways. We can use virtual hearings like this session now to communicate with each other uh, and that can be perfectly satisfactory. So finally, I hope to have demonstrated that um, mediation has been part of our tradition and culture in England since at least the 13th century. Uh, that the courts here are giving every encouragement to mediation and indeed are considering going uh, so far as to make it mandatory. Um, and I've also expressed the hope that the uh, existentialist issue of our times, that of climate change, that businesses don't um, uh, tear each other up uh, apart in the courts, uh, but instead um, look for mediated outcomes. And I think uh, I'm bang on time. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, you can't be better. But now what I'll do is, of course, look, I, ha I will have things to ask you. So that's, that is, a, I mean, it goes without saying. But let me just first take you through what you were saying about the Green Pledge. There is this Green Pledge. If you would see the screen here. Yes. There is a World Mediators Alliance on Climate Change, and there yes. is the Green Pledge there for mediators. 
So on the mediator's aspect also, people are conscious about it. I signed it. You should also sign it. I, I actually have signed it. And um, I was, um, I think perhaps on the arbitration front, they've gone a bit further in terms of their analysis um, and their proposals. But you're quite right. There is already the Green Pledge um, extending to or for mediation. And it makes sense. It makes sense. And it, I think the whole concept works. So there's not an issue there. But more importantly, Jonathan, you have to tell us that we have this history of mediation, as you put us. Put okay, arbitration and mediation in the history. But today, after so many years, hundreds of years, we still have to force people to go for mediation. Where did things go wrong? What is the issue? Why is it not taking off the way we would want it to take it off? Take off. Because it's counterintuitive. Well, there, there's. Um... There's a number of reasons. Um, uh, one is that um, the lawyers are the main gatekeepers and uh, asking um, the lawyers to vote for mediation is like asking a turkey to vote for an early Christmas. Now, I think there are perfectly good answers to that, which I gave to uh, when I was in practice, that to those who quiz me on this subject, I think the best answer to that is that at the moment, um, clients with disputes give the case to their lawyers through gritted teeth because they know it will involve them in um, a mountain of work, assembling all the evidence, it will involve them in crippling legal costs. And um, perhaps even more significant than the legal costs is the, uh, the fact that the extensive work which their lawyers require them to do will be a diversion from current and future projects. So it's not only costing money, but it's also uh, reducing prospects of um, uh, impacting future earnings, let's say. Um, you know, there are, so the, the cynical reason is that lawyers are the main uh, gatekeepers. Uh, another is that um, it's counterintuitive, two parties in dispute, uh, and you're asking them to go to a third party who has no coercive powers at all, how is that gonna help? You know, I say you are plain wrong. You're never gonna convince me to the contrary. How can George, that man in the, in the middle, the mediator, you know, he's got no power to direct either of us to do anything. How is that gonna solve anything? Now, the uh, outside the mediation community, uh, there may be a fair few who entertain those sorts of doubts. But I think there's something, I think, I don't know what we have to figure out because look, I have my thoughts on it. For me, you've met someone who's totally sold out on mediation. I've introduced you. So the person has experienced it good user experience, sold out on it. So in all these hundreds of years, have we either not found the right people or that those user experiences that we wanted people to have to spread the world did not happen? What There is some disconnect there which we have to bring out because the, the process works. We know that. People yeah. have benefited from it. We know that. I'll tell you another um another thing I sense is this. Um, as I said, I deal with commercial cases. Often there are large corporations involved. The key protagonists might be lower middle management level. Um, one has taken action with the, which the other suggests shouldn't have been taken and, and there's amour propre and there's all of that. But as we know, 
um, for a mediation to work, you have to have senior decision makers present. And that's an investment of time. Now, I know that compared with a case in court, it's a minor amount of time. I mean, perhaps the average commercial case may take one week in court, five days, 10 days, something like that, whereas most mediations would be resolved within uh, one working day. So you have the potential for, you know, 80% plus time and cost saving. But when the case is sent off to the lawyers, senior management don't need to worry about it anymore. Um, the lawyer is dealing with it. Uh, it's the middle management which will deal with the evidence and, and, and cater, deal with the demands made by the lawyers. And the senior management can get on and do their uh, usual thing. When a mediation takes place, um, it's a member of senior management who needs to uh, get directly involved. Now, of course, it should be a no brainer. Um, if there's a dispute that can be resolved in one day at, at 10, maximum 20% of the cost that will be involved if the case goes to a fully contested court hearing, wouldn't that senior manager say, of course, I must invest that time? Yes, if explained that clearly, with evidence demonstrating that, in fact, uh, mediation does work. But there um, comes the next difficulty, which is that you know that court or arbitration will work in the sense that there will be a final decision. You don't know that there will necessarily be finality resulting from mediation. So you could invest the time and expense in the mediation only to have to proceed in court or arbitration in any event. Mm. Now, the biennial report that I mentioned uh, in my paper, um, they, uh, their findings from, from their research are that approaching 90% of mediations are successful. Uh, upwards of 75% settling on the day and about a further 15% settling within a matter of days or let's say within a short period um, thereafter. So, um, of course, if someone is explaining to senior management those factors that clearly, then I would hope that senior management would say, well, Jonathan, given that you've now explained it in those terms, okay, I will invest that one day uh, to be available for the mediation hearing. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, logic should work there, where you're calling to you, logic should work there. But, but I'm saying, I still feel that the numbers, either the numbers are not enough for people to, the, for the word to spread, I mean, I don't know, so in terms of CEDAR and other institutions, actual numbers, because one is the value. We talk about value, but what, what about the number of matters? Because we have on the other side, I don't know what's the backlog in UK is, but we have large number of matters there. So those numbers on that end in litigation, and when we talk about mediation, those numbers, are not, you don't, they just don't match. So there is... Yeah. You know. I mean, one of the other interesting findings from the... Um, I mentioned it at the beginning, the Singapore International Dispute Resolution Academy uh, <clears throat> report um, and, and the findings from that were, as I say, it, it announced at a webinar just this morning. 60%, um, I think this is right, that they said that 60% of uh, mediations happen because um, mediation was mandated by the contract. Mm -hmm. 
or was otherwise mandatory. So it might be a jurisdiction in which it's mandatory irrespective of the contract or the contract says the parties must mediate. And just pausing there, the English courts would enforce, in general terms, would enforce a mediation provision. So uh, if that's right, then the best way to encourage the more widespread use of mediation is indeed to get it into contracts. And um, some would say to make mediation mandatory. As I say, I don't go for that. I think the English courts actually don't have a bad balance at the moment in that um, the regime here at the moment is that if um, you or I, you and I, let's say, are in dispute. You're the claimant. Um, I'm, I propose mediation to you. If you either uh, reject that without giving any reasons or reject it on unreasonable grounds, or you simply ignore it, or you apparently buy into it, but then do everything possible to stall the mediation attempt. In all those circumstances, you could go ahead with your court claim. You could win the case against me. Normally that would involve that you recover your legal costs. And in a high court case, that is likely to be a six figure sum. So a hundred thousand pounds or more uh, in any complex case, for sure. And yet because of your failure to engage with mediation, the court is very likely to deprive you of your costs. So that's quite a significant incentive to you to um, pick up my mediation proposal and say, yes, Jonathan, let's mediate and indeed then buy into it uh, properly. Because I think, Jonathan, I, all the discussions I have and I've been having them, on, I, have, I have this one thought on this, that the point is that a person goes into the court he knows what the court is about and the court gives a decision. And then for whatever reason, is it the backlog? It's the delay that you are going to, because you can't, I'm saying that the court itself is not efficient in its functioning. So it cannot give you a decision on the same day or the next day or the a week after. When we say justice de de delayed, when is justice delayed? It is, is do I need a just that decision today or it is one year or 10 years? In, in the case of India, average 14 years. So justice delayed is justice denied. So which point are we denying justice? And if we are denying justice and we know we are denying justice and to just keep that matter away, we are saying, no, go for a resolution process, which is totally opposite for what you came to us. It is something that we should not be even connected with. We are, uh, this is litigation. This is courts. We are, this is decision. We are telling you to do something, which is something that you take your decision. You settle the matter yourself. Is it the right for even the courts to mention it? The mandatory is far away to even mention of the process. It's like I was giving an example. I've given it in one of those sessions also that you go to the government. Uh, there is a village. There is no connection of the road to the village. They go to the government, say, look, we, well, you connect our village with the road. And the government forces them, no, you have to make the road yourself. Will the government get away with it? Will the courts let them get away with it? How come the courts can get away with telling people to do something which is totally opposite of what they came to you for? I just find that a little strange that we are, they're getting away with it. Is it that, look, we... For us, we can say this is the colonial mindset. The courts are there. They can tell us what to do. But you are the colony. <laughs> I mean, you are the colonizer. How do you justify it? We can put it on you or everything we can put on you in the court system. But how do you justify this? Because what is um, at stake is, um, well, ultimately, of course, society itself the well-being of society itself, but for the particular parties, the resolution of their dispute. 
Now, resolution doesn't have to mean one party winning and the other losing. And what the court is looking at is um, what is not just um, resolution of the dispute through the court, but what is the best means? It's perfectly open to the judge, for example, to suggest to parties if he feels he or she has enough information. Um, don't you think you ought to discuss settlement? Because having heard what I've heard thus far and seen what I've seen thus far, it seems to me X, Y, Z. Would you like to think about that? Um, so the court's function is to help the parties see to resolution of their dispute, which would ultimately be through a decision of the court, if no other appropriate means is out there. But there's nothing at all that seems to me improper in the court saying there are more expeditious um, means out there to resolve your dispute than waiting for uh, your day in court. But aren't you, don't you look at it from this perspective that that particular court cannot do its job? Like I said, what is its job? Is its job to do it in one day? Maybe not. Maybe in one week? Maybe not. We don't know what that time period should be because justice delayed is an issue because if you're a criminal case and you're lying in jail somewhere, you want your decision th the same day. Why would you? Isn't it a human right violation to be kept in jail when actually the matter could go in your favor? But now you're sitting with a judge who cannot do its job. There's too much that's, backlog. But that's where I'd quarrel with you. Um, well, I'd Hold quarrel on. with you on this in that, um, by the way, uh, sorry, I take, I take that back because we're talking about two different scenarios. Um, I can understand and indeed when I was in practice had personal experience of the sort of delays that can occur in India. And that raises special considerations. Uh, of course, I can see that. Um, we're fortunate perhaps in England and Wales not to have that problem by and large. I mean, how it, you know, in some courts post COVID, there will be delays, not in the commercial court, by the way, because I think the commercial court was the very first to embrace virtual hearings. So most trials continued almost without interruption throughout um, the COVID period. Um, it was brilliant in terms of how it reacted, how speedily and effectively. So broadly, um, we don't have that problem of delay in the court system. Of course, any court procedure, any arbitration procedure will take a lot longer than mediation but not to the point that it's unconscionable. Um, so the courts are doing their job, but the judge is fully, in, the judge is dealing with the administration of justice. And in the particular case, um, the matter may best be resolved through uh, an alternative means than decision by the court. Nothing improper in the judge suggesting that at the moment he can't mandate it. Well, uh, there is some authority actually for saying there's a recent case in the Court of Appeal called uh, Lomax, where the court decided that it did have power to compel parties to engage in ENE, early neutral evaluation. Um, and as I say, soon there may be that power with mediation itself. So basically, you look at the uh, so you look at the courts from an angle that they decide for the parties what is best for the parties, and the parties are not the best people to decide what is good for you. So you, there is that still. Like I'm saying, from us, we can put it on the colony, the fact that we're a colony, and the colonizer has given us this system, and that system survives that the court knows best, and we have to move away from that. That the court is a service provider for a certain function, and that you go to them for that function. So that culture of mediation to develop has to happen outside 
outside the court system. I mean, I'm just I'm I'm saying it from my perspective. I'm just looking at it that if to force someone to do something and to suggest something, they're very different things. That okay, in my opinion, I think if you try to do it yourself, it's not that I can't do my job. If you tell me, I will do my job. I can give you justice in the way I think is justice. But if you think that is the way to do it, I think it might work. Do it. That's one way. One is look. Like in an Indian perspective, I can't do my job. I will not be able to give you justice maybe for 14 years. So you are better off there. But it's not that I, you, are, you are better off there and you do it yourself. I will force you to do it because I can't do my job. So that is, a, I mean, there's lots to do. This, is, this discussion will keep but going another, on. Uh, Vikram, another way of viewing this is to say that um, justice as administered by the courts is a public resource funded by the taxpayers and the judges are perfectly right to um, control that public resource so as to ensure that there is a certain proportionality. In other words, I don't have the right to tie up an uh, indeterminate, an excessive amount of court time for my dispute, which perhaps could perfectly satisfactorily be resolved by other means. So that's also a factor which I think is legitimate when you have a finite resource, uh, public resource funded by the public, uh, you know, then it needs to be controlled that no one person or a set of litigants takes an unfair proportion of that resource. So I'll tell you what the situation actually is. Actually, the situation is you go into court, you file the court fee, your matter goes into court. In India, under the civil procedure code, they say that once the pleadings are complete, then the judge sees whether this matter should go in for mediation and sends it for mediation. So now you can see what time has taken, pleadings have happened, court has spent time on <clears> it. Then it goes to the mediation center. It is almost free. Okay, so you have a structure of a mediation center that people involved is almost free what they get, maybe not even some cases, not even five pounds, sometimes 10 pounds for a whole mediation. Okay, so th there are th sessions uh, there are for a whole session. So there are, it's almost free for the parties. Now, if they do settle, the matter comes back. And of course, the court passes a decree, but the court fee gets refunded. Mm -hmm. So tell me, isn't the taxpayer actually funding the dispute? You are saying that you are looking at that resource, finite resource. Actually, the taxpayer is funded. Why should the taxpayer be funding your dispute? They have got this court system. They've got these judges. Everything we paying for it. Aren't we paying for it? And to for then after that also, you end up paying for that person's dispute. So mm -hmm. I, it, there is, there is not as simple as it might seem. It is not. It's not. Yeah. It, 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 there is a lot, the lots we we'll obviously we'll keep debating on this aspect because I, I have my view on this. I'm very strong about my view because for me, it's not just about the resources. It's about the profession not developing. If you no. get it for free, if you get something for 10 pounds, yes. are you, you going to pay it? Yeah. Are you going to pay 10,000 pounds for it? When are you going to do it? How would you even tell people that, look, I got this for one pound or 10 pounds. You must pay 10,000 pounds. Oh, mm. better. Why don't you go to court? file your matter in court, you'll get the court fee back also, and it will be sent to the court system, to the mediation center. You'll get it for almost free. Why do you want to go to a private mediator? Mm. So uh, what, are, what kind of a route are we creating there? Mm. Are we saying, no, now we are going to say that people will file if even mediation takes off, they will go and file it in courts. Mm. I don't know about the UK, what kind of uh, amounts those mediators get and what parties have to pay. I, I, that part you can tell us more about that. But I'm telling you the Indian scenario, the entire mediation would be maybe there is some courts on a good court, which is paying something to the mediator might be hundred pounds for the entire mediation. Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine? So I, I'm, what are we telling people? File, file matters in court, nothing at all. Your court fee will be refunded. You will get for hundred pounds, a whole mediation. I mean, come off yeah. it, Jonathan. How do you justify that? How will you justify that? Okay. How, when yeah, will we develop the profession? Today. Yeah. 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 So when do we develop the profession? That's what I'm asking now. Of course, we'll get the quote out of the picture. Is private mediation developing in the UK? Can someone be only a mediator? Yes. Um, there are not 
too many at the moment who are in that for, fortunate position. Um, some of us are. I'm, it's probably uh, measured in, you know, the hundreds rather than more. I'm sure it's in the hundreds rather than more. Um, whereas, uh, you know, there are, of course, thousands of arbitrators and, and lawyers. And so it's, it's a small, it's those who make um, a living out of it. It's at the moment still quite a small number, but the numbers are increasing. If I remember rightly, the last biennial report before the latest one this, this May, uh, the overall total for commercial cases mediated stood at about 12,000. In the latest report, it's about 16,000. Now, obviously, 4,000 is a significant increase. In overall terms, it's still small compared with the number of court cases uh, filed, but it's, it's growing. And, you know, steps now being looked at by the courts will ensure further growth. Um, personally, I, I mean, I'm aware in the shipping world of uh, increasing um, the instances of um, mediation clauses being included in shipping contracts. One of the big um, shipping bodies, BIMCO, uh, which prepares, which drafts a lot of the shipping contracts, their standard dispute resolution clauses now, I think all of them include mediation. So, you know, that is, as I said, that's very important. Parties tend to do what the contract tells them to do in most cases. Um, so the fact that mediation is called for by the contract is, I think, really important. Um, also, I, I, you know, Singapore Convention, you mentioned it, um, you raised it, Vikram, with the last speaker. Again, I think it's important. There are lots of people who say that um, it's the New York Convention which propelled um, international commercial arbitration into pole position, you know, as the most popular um, international dispute resolution mechanism. So maybe um, the Singapore Convention will start to do for mediation what the New York Convention has done for arbitration. Yeah, because if countries start for, to ratify, if they get a law, why would they only keep it to international commercial mediation? They would definitely try and get a domestic for the domestic mediation also. So it yeah. just highlights it. But the only thing, but in terms of the law in UK for private mediation, I mean, you can also tell us about the other mandatory and all those things. What I mean, mm. the mandatory is now in 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 the works. But the legal structure, you can tell us, but on the private mediation part of it as i understand there is no such law regulating it so how how does how does the, how do things work oh there's um no you're right i mean you don't need to have uh, anyone anyone can call themselves i think a mediator in practice um you know the sort of people i work with on disputes would want to be satisfied that you are um, uh, regulated by the Civil Mediation Council. So who are the bodies who regulate mediators? In, in, the, in England, it's Civil Mediation Council, International Mediation Institute. Not too many of us, I think, are accredited by IMI. Some of us are. Um, they impose requirements in terms of the number of mediations you conduct. Um, you have to carry insurance and so on and so forth. So, yeah. Um, but at the moment, it's not a regulated profession. So anyone could pop up and say, I'm a mediator, come and appoint me. 
without being registered with the um, CMC. But don't you think that is the right way to go about it? Because the parties have to find their own person whom they trust or can we tell them we can limit mm. it to the limit them to whom they can go to? Should we be doing that? Because India also, now we have a very good law, which of course I'll take you through if whenever you want to. But that law is perfect in terms of the confidence, protecting confidentiality and without prejudice, which according to me, UK, UK doesn't have at that moment in the moment. We have all that, but at the same time, it does not regulate who can be a mediator, which is, we call them conciliate, that conciliation law. But so how, how do you look at that? I mean, if you, you do get a domestic law, if you do sign the convention. I, I think we need to be careful because um, uh, one bad mediator uh, can give bad, uh, mediation a, a bad name. So I forget who it was who told me, you know, if, if you, whatever your profession may be, let's say as lawyer, if you do a good job for your client, he will tell 10 of his friends. If you do a bad job for the client, he will tell 50 of his friends. Now, I forget the exact numbers or yeah, ratio, yeah. but the point I'm making is that a good job appears to get less coverage than a bad job. And the danger, if it's completely unregulated, is that you have uh, bad mediations with mediation itself being given a bad name with word getting out there. It's not a good thing to go into. I got completely ripped off and blah, blah, blah. So I would prefer to see um, a certain level of regulation, which, you know, doesn't prevent the um, those who are able and willing, you know, is, is not so onerous that it becomes a big disincentive, but gives a certain level of protection to the public. I mean, because how I look at it, it is very, I mean, simple. Or in the law, all you have to say is, unless the parties otherwise agree, so and so can be, be are the, we are the mediators who you have, have to have this, whatever, if there has to be certification. But the, ultimately, you have to leave that one sentence to the parties. Because the moment you take that away, then that means you are saying, somewhere the government wants to get into it, legislature wants to get into it, you still want to get into people's disputes where you did set up courts for that, you did want to regulate disputes, it didn't work out somewhere. So why do you want to get into this private affair of people? I just want to understand because this is not something new, which is what we were trying to get into that in historically as a part of the culture, how it's been, how it is developed. Today also, I will ask you in terms of the rural population in the country, do we see some traditional form of mediation happening there? Is there some system there so that we can learn from that and take that forward? Well, um, there may well be, uh, you know, county councils which decide to uh, include mediation provisions in, in their terms and in their terms with, um, you know, users of council services, suppliers and, and the like. Um, there may well be clubs and associations which do the same. Um, at the moment, it's up to um, you know all concerned to decide: do they see mediation as being um, you know a user-friendly way of dealing with things? Okay, I'm, I, I was increase, increasingly that's the case that people are saying, "Yep, this is uh, better uh, for us and those with whom we have relationships. It's a better way of sorting out differences." Well, I was looking more at the fact that is there a concept that like we talk about the village elder and the village you going to a village elder and they helping you resolve no, the I don't I don't think so. The village elders have died out. <laughs> You're left with uh, the Boris Johnsons and their lookalikes uh, at local level, uh, who people don't view in quite the same way. Um, uh, I won't say more. <laughs> So that is one aspect. I think that is something which is 
I, I don't know what it was earlier also because the, the, what, whatever you read out, there is something there. Definitely it was, there was a process, there were mm. people doing it. So definitely it was there, something down the chain, something yes. happened. Because I'm telling you, on the other end here, I'm trying to discuss this aspect that colonization has affected the entire concept of collaborative dispute resolution in the colonies. So that aspect of it, lots of that comes up that once that colonization happened, what happened to the traditional methods and how the court system has had spoiled everything there. Mm. So that part of it is definitely something that we have to look at from the colonies perspective. But as the colonizers perspective, I was looking at your end also, things are similar to a certain extent where that traditional method of doing it is went away. Yeah. Yeah. So, that, so the court system is the court system to blame. Are we then still relying on a system which didn't work for us? And today we want to go out of it. I mean, is there a restructuring of that or has to happen for this to take off? Is there something it's connected in that sense? Have to because we have a civil procedure code which we got from you in 1908. We are still continuing with it. So I don't know about you, what your civil procedure code looks like, but you have given us something where the lawyers have had something very nice to work with. And they worked yes. with it so well yes. that we have the dependency. Well, I, I, I do recall in a case I had with India that there was, uh, the Indian lawyer was telling me, look, this is basically an English statute. So I said, yeah, very interesting, but it's not an English statute that... Um, uh, has been on the statute book here in England <laughs> since the time I started in practice. So I'm sorry to say, but I'm in complete ignorance of it. And um, actually, the new regime is um, is completely different. So we still, I, uh, yeah, we're still hanging on to the colonial legacy that yeah, we've got. Yeah. Similarly, so I, our, our Indian people... English law. Yeah. I mean, would you have any idea what our when our Indian penal code was given to us? What year is that? Uh, no, no. Just a guess, just a guess, just a guess. What year is our Indian Penal Code? What does it say after that? Indian Penal Code, what year you think it says? Uh, 1896. Close, 1860. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, wow. <laughs> Can you imagine no, what we've got? I, I was hoping it was going to be later, but... Um... Gosh, 1860. Yes. yes, time time to um, for Mr. Modi to um, reappraise. And what I'm saying is that on one end, the courts are saying that you push mediation and for mandatory mediation in India, that civil procedure code of 1908, you don't want to talk about. This new, you should get a mediation law, you should do this. The Supreme Court of India goes and says that. What about their civil procedure code, which is in the body? They don't talk about it. So, it's, I mean, no. there are a lot of factors there, but yeah. in any case, but I think, Jonathan, we can obviously keep having a conversation, which I love doing with you. But at this point, I would want to end the YouTube thing because no one watches long videos. <laughs> I've noticed that. <laughs> so, th thank you very much. It was obviously, like I said, always nice talking to you. And your, your whatever, I mean, so, so much that you've told us about the history. I think that's an important thing, which even the UK needs to look at that. Do we mm -hmm. need to go back to that? So, yeah. yeah. So any Thank final you, words, Dr. any final words, anything that you want to tell us? No, um, congratulations on this initiative to um, bring together, I think, for the first time, um, mediation aficionados from around the world. Um, to put together a patchwork of um, you know, what is taking place in different parts of the world. And um, it does matter, it does matter. There's no doubt that uh, you know, how you deal with disputes um, has a substantial impact on the quality of the society. So uh, let's all hope that mediation continues to develop a pace um, and that uh, mediators are paid sensible sums for exactly. their um, for their efforts. Main thing, just for them to be valued. I, I'm just asking for that. I'm just saying yeah. they should be valued. Yeah. There are special people. They're doing a special thing. They're actually exactly. helping you resolve in a manner which is amicable. 
so just value them take them forward like that don't give the give the whole service for free so that people are going to yeah. always think that this is oh, i mean is it to be valued so i think that definitely is going to come up so thank you uh, prime minister mcmillan said there is no such thing as a free lunch exactly and so, here we've got lots of free uh, lunches are being distributed every day you, you shouldn't have well way up the price what actually was given or extracted or but certainly there shouldn't be free mediators yep exactly well, on that note let me just end the